Four Old Voices Festival. Um, the, uh, this event gets more exciting every year. Um, I'm sure most of you know all about Penn, but for those of you who don't, Penn is active in 100 countries. It's pushing 100 years old. Um, it is the only organization that is devoted to supporting free expression and literary culture. Uh, Penn works on behalf of imprisoned writers, writers who are fighting censorship. Um, it fights uh, surveillance uh, and censorship around the world. Uh, it's a crucial organization, and I really encourage any of you who aren't involved in it to go to the website, Penn.org, um, to sign up for our newsletters, to follow us on, on Twitter, on Facebook, to see how you might get more involved and find out about more events, including the remaining World Voices events over the next few days, over the weekend. Um, and without further ado, I want to turn it over to the great Wayne Kostenbaum, uh, who will introduce tonight's exciting event. Thanks. And well, if you do that, thank you, Jacob. The first thing I want to ascertain, is there any water up here? There should be. That's the most important thing, isn't it? <laughs> now we'll move to ideas. <laughs> I am Wayne Kostenbaum, and I'm, we are here. Oh, just feedback or something. Um, I want to welcome you again to the Penn World Voices Festival of International Literature. I thank our sponsors, and I thank our more than 100 volunteers for making this possible. Um, and I urge you to be aware that the festival lasts until May 10th, and there are lots of exciting voices for you to attend to. The theme this year is Africa, and the theme next year will be Mexico. Um, books are for sale at the table outside, where we will all gather when this event is over. Um, and I would like to now ask you to turn off all devices. Except for your ears. I don't see a lot of flurry of hands turning off devices, but that's because you're all very well prepared, I suppose. Okay, so I want to say a few words first about Susan Sontag and the uh, raison d'etre of this panel, and then I'm going to um, introduce our speakers, and I prime each of them with a question, and a question individually crafted for each of them, and they will begin there, and then we will have a freewheeling conversation. So, um, I think the, the intention of this panel is very simply to honor and celebrate Susan Sontag and her work. Um, her collision with the universe in body is recent enough for her to be still a felt presence in New York and an absence, a felt absence. So I think also as a former president of Penn, uh, the sense memory of Sontag is still very vivid and present. And I think our first, our, you know, ethically or whatever, we are really here to uh, reanimate Sontag, who needs really not a lot of help in that regard because she left a lot of books behind. <laughs> But the, the people that we've gathered here for the panel are people who are um, not scholars of Sontag, but reactivators and reanimators of Sontag. Creative artists in various media who have um, taken on the burden of giving voice to Sontag's afterlife, often in very personal ways. Um, and because of, particularly because of the publication of Sontag's journals posthumously, that has made possible, I think, for a younger generation of readers to confront a Sontag and to appreciate a Sontag that was not available um, when I was growing up. Um, a, a Sontag who is more openly vulnerable and who, for whom the contradictions and conflicts and um, poignancies were not merely to be decoded from the work, but were evident right away. So that I, th I think that what the work that you have all done is to um, confront the new Sontag. And I think this is, um, Sontag is not over. Uh, the sense of Sontag is an unfolding possibility for kindling avidities in readers and cultural workers for kindling interest in activism and for taking 
brave and unpopular stance is um, still work to be done by, I guess, going over her work and allowing its contemporary possibilities to be heard. This is not an archival panel. Sontag is not over. Um, so um, I want to say four. I, Sontag gave me advice, not in person. I only met her twice. But on the page, she gave me four pieces of advice that I want to share with you. The first is eat the world. This comes from her essay on uh, Jean, on Sartre, excuse me, and against interpretation, where she refers to philosophy as a cosmophagic enterprise. So, the philosopher eats the world. So did Sontag, and so must we. Two, move on. <laughs> In her essay on Roland Barthes, she said, quoting it, that it is the esthete's prerogative to move on. On, to be in flight from what has been written. And so Sontag always meant to me a force of restless migration from the received and from yesterday, what was written or said yesterday. Third, no tasks. She worked hard on her essays, and they are earnestly and rigorously crafted, as is her fiction. Um, but she, in an essay, an essay from the mid-90s, she quoted, I think, Manet, who said, um, when I'm in the studio, this is a paraphrase, when I'm in the studio, I must remember no tasks. She, Sante quoted that at a time when she was really divorcing herself from essay writing and plunging into fiction in a new way. It was the time of the volcano lovers. Uh, gestation and publication, and I think the task that she felt she wanted to get rid of was essay writing, but even in her essays, she's always getting rid of the task. The task is the earlier sentence, and so, I, so Sontag tells me every day, no tasks. Finally, it is, she says, turn to language for excitement and solace. I want to read one brief paragraph from Sontag. who says, it's the last paragraph of, yeah, this is the problem with having too many things, so I may just um, summarize it. Yeah, that's okay. You know, I'm not finding it right now, so we're just going to leave it, but I'm just going to summarize it for you. Maybe that's better. Maybe Sontag would have wanted that. She's talking about the, uh, the ending of uh, Elizabeth Hardwick's essay novel, Sleepless Nights, and she says, um, she says more or less, multiply the possibilities for attentiveness, look for hot lexical choices, hot lexical choices, engorged adjectives. Huh. I mean, that <laughs> is the Sontag I want, somebody who understands that, I think she's Use language to, this is it, to cauterize the torment of personal relations. To cauterize the torment of personal relations. Turn to hot lexical choices to seek quasi-erotic consolation. I'm moved by that. Okay. Now, first, Mo. Mo Angelos. I'm just going to introduce you all and then you're going to do your spiel. Okay. okay, Mo Angelos has done many things. She's collaborated with the Builders Association as a performer and writer. Um, she's one of five lesbian brothers, which is so beautiful. Um, a permanent contribution, I think. Um, and she is famous for it. She's here today because she, has, um, worked, she wrote and performed the critically acclaimed theater piece Sontag Reborn at New York Theater Workshop in 2013, and it continues to tour. And what is amazing about this is that you see in the flesh Mo undergo the trend, sort of impersonating Sontag. Sontag is first is like Judy Garland in Summer Stock, I think. Uh, eager, the, the big show she wants to put on is Western Civilization. Uh, you know, and, then, and then, but then as time passes, she begins to under, in the way that Garland 
did after Diana Durbin, she finds jazz, she finds the contemporary, and she finds suffering of a more immediate kind. And that most performance um, dramatizes the inner evolution of a writer, which is in some sense something that we never see on screen or stage. The kind of Bildungsroman build-up that created Sontag. So that's an amazing thing. It's really great, great work. Um, Nancy Cates here um, is the, the prime mover of this event because she made a, f I mean, in other words, her film made this event happen. Her film is Regarding Susan Sontag, which is going to be shown tomorrow night. Nancy will tell you a little bit <laughs> about that. It premiered at the 2014 Tribeca Film Festival, where it received a special jury mention and great response. Ms. named it one of the ten best feminist films of the year. Um, and uh, Nancy is also famous for the film Brother Outsider, The Life of Bayard Rustin. With, she made it with Bennett Singer, which premiered in 2003 at Sundance um, and received the 2004 GLAAD Media Award. Nancy spent, a, a, in a sort of Sontag-like way, you devoted yourself to Sontag as a project. Um, and the, you spoke to Sontag's lovers, uh, you spoke to everyone around Sontag, and you made. You spoke to me briefly. It's fine. I'm not. I wasn't her lover. Um, you know, you, you, um, but what the, the picture of Sontag as um, a vulnerable mind, ever turning itself over, trying to find a way to reflect more accurately the luminosities and disasters of the world, actually happens in the movie theater. And um, I think it will for the, the film forever changes most people's ideas of what it meant to be Susan Sontag and what it meant, means to read her. It's really an amazing film. Um, and then alphabetically next, Sigrid Nunez, who is known first of all as a novelist. She's published six novels, including A Feather on the Breath of God, The Last of Her Kind, and most recently, Salvation City. And she's here with us tonight because of her memoir, Sempre Susan, a memoir of Susan Sontag, which I think for all the historical work it does telling us about Sontag, it's most exemplary, I think, as a specimen of the art of the memoir. The miracle of this book is that you, Sigrid, utterly, even though it's very personal, you step aside. There is no filigree, there's no ego, there's no showing off. It is um, as if taking place at an enormous distance even from language, and what's left is a kind of haiku distillation of the, the sense of Sontag really right there. It's, I think, um, I can't think of another memoir, you know, it's other than the novels perhaps of Marguerite Duras, which have that um, quality of shorn language in service of reporting something lacerating. It's really a moving book. Um, and finally, Craig Seligman, who was born in Louisiana, lived in San Francisco and elsewhere. Um, I discovered his writing first, I think, in the Three Penny Review. He's worked with and for just about every good magazine and journal in the nation, um, and was for a long time the lead book critic and book editor as well for Bloomberg News. And he's here because of his landmark book, Sontag and Kale, Opposites Attract Me, which is a Absolute funny the combination of Sontag and Kale is totally brilliant. Oh. Every writer in town was so jealous when that book came out. <laughs> Mike White and the two people we always loved, Sontag and Kale. And um, it's, a, I think, a real classic of the eccentric work of literary criticism. It reminds me a lot, I think, of um, Nicholson Baker's You and I, or um, even David Plant's uh, Difficult Women, or Hilton Alls's The Women. It's um, an attempt to wrestle, uh, and, or, or Jeff Dyer's Out of Sheer Rage, his book about D.H. Lawrence, it's a, it's a funny wrestling match, an hag on, um, with Sontag and Kale against each other, but also with your conflicted allegiances and divergences from them. It's a feisty book, and a, a beautiful to read. So that's it for me for much of the night. <laughs> Apologies for going on for at so much length, but it's 
my hobby. Um, <laughs> so I, I, again, I prime each of the speakers with um, a question, and then I'm going to have to answer it. But I'm now going to give the floor to them alphabetically. I think, starting with you, Mo, okay. to say your piece. Okay. Uh, can you hear me if I don't use the mic? Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Uh, good evening. I'm, I'm reading because I'm trying to keep on time. Okay. Um, I'd uh, first like to thank Penn World Voices for having me be a part of this impressive panel on the contradictory, amazing, human Susan Sontag. Um, I'm honored to be here in the fine company of my fellow distinguished Sontag chasers, as I joke to Wayne. Um, Sontag was a great reader, as her published journals evidence, and my co-panelists who knew her well can probably back this up. She had a thing about reading, adored it, plunged into it, took immense pleasure in devouring books she admired as a hungry woman would set upon a meal. It makes perfect sense that I know her through her words. The things of this world that seem to give her the most satisfaction and no small amount of agony. I do not wish, wish to put more words in the mouth of someone so eloquently wordy but I think it's safe to say this. Susan Sontag really cared about words, language, meaning, and all the philosophical tangles associated with that slippery slope, a slope I not now find myself upon. <laughs> In the volume of her early published journals entitled Reborn, which was beautifully edited by her son, the writer David Reef, Sontag makes many, many lists of things that are important to her. Music she wished to hear, books she wished to buy and read, words she w was learning the meaning of, uh, both in English and several foreign languages, and the list of the lists can go on and on. These lists are a kind of shorthand, a tool for memory. Reading them, I feel her pressing necessity to experience everything, read everything, go everywhere, to follow her voracious curiosity. She was a woman who put the urge in urgency. <clears throat> many of the lists are in the published journals, though there are too many for practical publication. The Sontag completists of you out there will need to take a trip to UCLA to the special collections of the Charles Young Research Library to have the fuller satisfaction of looking at the journals in the original, to see the things which cannot be published but are a part of the record she left behind for us to ponder. It is interesting to note that since I visited the archives in 2011, more material has come to the collection, as more items have been discovered in what I can only assume are some boxes of things that escaped the initial transfer of her materials and personal library to UCLA. The finding aid online is fascinating, and the things that have made their way to the collection now include more pedestrian items, like her checking account statement, with checks, evidently, her tax returns, her daily agendas, all of which help to tell a more complete story about the kind of life she lived. I look forward to another trip to that quiet room in LA, silent as a cloister, where no photographing is allowed. We've changed that. Oh yeah? Yeah. Okay, well, <laughs> perhaps there are some things, after all, apparently not, that do not <laughs> exist to end in a photograph. <laughs> the challenge of turning these materials from the archive and the journals into a piece of performance were substantial. It is not possible to translate all those furiously written words into stage action in a traditional theatrical vocabulary. Then there are the objects in that archive as well, things, which cannot be turned into a piece of show business. Okay, perhaps they can, but extreme caution must be taken to utilize, for instance, the tactile information of handling the notebooks. Notebook number seven, as she titled it on its brown spiral bound cover, had something sticky on its back cover, I noted. <laughs> what was the stickum and where did it come from and when did it appear? The notebook is the second one in the collection from the early 1940s and contains her record index, a list of classical composers. We cannot discern if she owned these records or wished to, nor what the sticky stuff is on the back cover. She was a teenager after all. 
I offer one more list, one that was not in the published journals, but on the reverse side of a typewritten story she wrote about leaving a class at Cal in 1949. She was a 16-year-old freshman, and it would seem falling in love. The story is about that perilous place of wanting and not wanting. In the margin of the page, in pencil, she wrote by hand, <clears throat> the inevitable letter from mother. <laughs> Here is what she wrote on the back, also in hand. One, stop nail biting. Two, buy no more books. Three, read everything very slowly. Four, talk slowly and infrequently. Five, no more lies or stealing. Not for ethics sake, but to stop hating myself because I'm so divided. When these five objectives are achieved, destroy this self-abuse and the memory of the life you forsook with the writing of this. The future is so clean and innocent. Thank you. Wow. She broke <laughs> so, I, I didn't prepare anything, but I'll use the mic so it's not going to make me feel powerful. Um, so, I just want to say that she may have said no tasks, but then there were the lists included lists of tasks, one of which we put in the movie, which was write mother three times a week, um, teach, I can't remember, there were five things on there, but these were, which was 24, but the list. Watch more often. The list were, yeah, yeah, she, she was against taking showers, and it's like, she kept telling herself to take a bath, and you know, it's like, you read this, and you're like, really, do I need to know this? Um, but the question that Wayne asked me ahead of time was what led me to spend eight years of my life thinking of film about Susan Sontag, and I have to say, temporary insanity is the only plausible answer, um, but actually it connects to what Mo was talking about, because I'm a bit of a reader myself, not in the league of Susan Sontag by any means, but I think that the film is ultimately a reader's kind of homage to a writer. And one of the wonderful, amazing things about making a film about Susan Sontag is I got to you know, work with Wayne and Sigrid and Craig, because Craig was a, an advisor to the film. I guess you were as well. These two were in it. Um, and, you know, I am someone who likes to do her homework, so I had the pleasure of, I read three of Sigrid's novels before I went to talk to her for the first time, which, you know, was a great pleasure. Um, you know, I, I, I read, I don't know, three or four of Nadine Gordimer's books before I went to Johannesburg to talk to her, which is a great honor since she's no longer with us. Um, but, so, anyway, to get around to the question, <laughs> um, there's an official answer to why I made this film and a less official answer. And um, we were talking before we started about Sontag's secrets and contradictions. Um, the official reason is that I've always been interested in her, and I came of age at the moment that the Susan Sontag Reader came out. I was 20 in 1982. Um, and I still have my copy of the Susan Sontag Reader from 1982, which is a paperback, but it has broken into two pieces. So we try not to use it too often at the office because it's, you know, it's kind of become an artifact. It's not 100 years old, but it's still fragile. Um, I think when you were 20 in 1982 and you were looking for someone to look up to, if you were maybe a, you know, kind of curious, I didn't know that I was a lesbian. I didn't know she was a lesbian, but I needed a role model. So in some distant way, she was kind of in another firmament, but there she was, she was a role model. And I was particularly interested in her, her insistence that we pay attention. So I was glad that you referred to that, because actually when Wayne brought this up in the interview, I, I think I started crying, because it was the thing that was so compelling to me about her, you know, beyond the intellect, beyond all these words, you know, mountains and mountains of words, there was this insistence that we pay attention to the world, and which is the thing that you know, unites almost everything that she did. Um, and, you know, it's hard to pay attention these days because of the internet, you know, Obama, whatever. <laughs> but, you know, she really insisted that we do that, and I think it's not a bad thing to remind ourselves of. So the less official reason that I made this film, and it's sort of weird to talk about this in public, is that there are a lot of narcissists in my life. And I have a friend who's a, like a research psychiatrist or psychologist or something, and he said, oh, you know, this film is about blank, you know, this other person in my life. And it was kind of, you know, I said, I'm going to have to kill you. <laughs> but the fact is that I don't think I understand the narcissist in my life any better than I did before I started this project, but I learned a few other things. So, of course, it was 
a really amazing experience. And I, I love the idea of being a Sontag chaser. I feel like I'm actually Sontag's last student or something. <laughs> or maybe not last. I, presumably there are other people who do other projects. But I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you. So um, I had never planned to write a book about Susan Sontag. I, it would not ever have entered my mind, in fact. But then someone was doing a, an anthology about uh, mentors and muses. Uh, and so I was asked to contribute an essay to the anthology, and I thought, oh, I know I want to write about Elizabeth Hardwick, because I had studied with Elizabeth Hardwick at, uh, when I was a, a student at Barnard. And when I presented this, I was told you can't do that because, in fact, two people are already writing about about uh, Elizabeth Hardwick. So then I thought, well, you know, I could write about I could write about Susan Sontag, and in fact, even though she was never a professor of mine, she was more of a mentor to me than any more of an influence than anyone I'd, I'd ever known. So. Um, so I wrote the 20-page essay, and before it came out in the book, it was published in Tin House, and then a publisher, uh, James Atlas, a publisher who was very interested in memoir and biography, asked me if I would be willing to turn it into a book, and I said, well, it depends on what you mean by book. Uh, I mean, I, you know, I definitely would not want to uh, write any kind of analysis of the work. I wouldn't write a biography, etc. But I realized that I had more to say that I could make a book-length essay. I could, I, you know, I could expand that essay in the same style. It wouldn't be much more than 100 pages, and that I could do. So I agreed to do it. And when I, um, you know, so I had, so I, I had a certain structure already. Uh, the, the thing is that I had. Um, I had met Susan Sontag very briefly when I was working as an editorial assistant at the New York Review of Books. And then I wasn't working there anymore. I had just uh, graduated from Columbia. Uh, I was in my 20s. And um, she was uh, 42, I believe, and was having her first bout with uh, breast cancer. And she wanted to get back to work. Um, and uh, so she asked uh, her friends, the editors of the New York Review of Books, is there someone you know who could help me just sit there at the typewriter while I dictate so I could get through this huge pile of correspondence I just let sit there. And uh, she at the time was living at 340 Riverside Drive, 106th Street, and I was living uh, between Broadway and Amsterdam and on 106th Street. And I said, well, so it would be very easy for you to do. Would you, would you do that? Would you like to do that? So I said, sure. So now that job only lasted about... 12 hours over three <laughs> meetings or whatever, but in the course of that, no, and it was, and, but they were, you know, the time I spent with her was, was extremely interesting in all kinds of ways, uh, because that was what she was like to be with. She was somebody who, as I say in the book, she was a natural mentor. She, you know, if she, if you were with her, you, you, she would just, you would find things out. She would be telling you about books that you had to read. She might even sit down and write them down on a piece of paper, a list. You should read these. She would tell you uh, about some movie she'd just seen, and she, she was so enthusiastic about this, and she so much wanted to share everything. Uh, it wasn't about me, as I say. Anybody who was around, she would try to get you to do these things that she loved. And it was really like one of her greatest pleasures that then she would find out, you know, did you like it? Did you like it? And it would mean so much to her that you did. Um, so anyway, during that time then, I met her son, who was actually, uh, had, had been to college and dropped out and now was finishing up at Princeton. But he was living also at 340 Riverside Drive. We started dating and then, I moved in, so the three of us lived together, well, <laughs> for a while. <laughs> um, and um, so, so, so yes, yeah, so we were, so we lived together, and then uh, eventually I moved out, uh, and I kept, uh, I, I uh, well, it's very, very complicated, but I <laughs> continued to know both Susan and David after that. Um, so I think when when you were interested in in, in asking me about the 
about the, the tone of the book or, or how... I love what you're I, saying, too, so just keep going. Oh, okay. So, well, with, 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 with the book, um, speaking of Elizabeth, of Elizabeth Hardwick, one of, the, one of the, the things that she says when she's teaching, and this is, this is very important, very true, uh, I, at the t one time I was trying to write about my parents, and I said to her, well, now that's, that's <coughs> difficult. I don't really know how I'm going to be able to do that. I, I did it for my first book. And she said, well, you know... The thing is, when you're writing, if you find the right tone, you can write about anything. And this is absolutely true. Um, and I knew that uh, with, the, with, the, with Semper Susan, I knew that what I wanted was, um, I did want, I did want a, a certain kind of detachment. I didn't want to write about myself at all in that, in that book. I wanted to write about her. I had to write about certain things like the relationship with David, but I really wanted it to be what it was like to look back and remember. What would I choose to remember? I mean, what would come back to me? What would, what would come back to me in a way that I would think, this is something the reader would want to know about? Uh, so it didn't have to be... You know, it could be in this collage-like form. I could be, it would, I could be nimble. I could move from one thing to another. I could free associate to some extent. Um, but I knew that that tone of detachment was was absolutely necessary because then uh, a portrait would emerge, and without my without my manipulating too much. And I wanted, um, I, the, the, I was also. This was both a. This is both challenging but also a very good thing that Susan was somebody who was extraordinarily open with everybody, even people she didn't know that well. You could say that she was actually quite careless. Uh, she would tell extraordinarily intimate uh, things, things that make her very vulnerable to, to people that she didn't even know well. So I knew that a great deal of what I knew and what I was writing down, although it would sound like a news in a certain way, were things that many other people knew. I also knew that, that people knew a lot about Susan anyway. I also knew that, the, I mean, there were other books that had already been written. David had written a, a, a memoir about her dying, that had just, just come out. The, um, there were all these obituary pieces, in memoriam pieces, and then there was, um, uh, the first volume of the journals was either out or coming out, so, in a way, I knew that, um, you know, I, I, just, I just wanted to put down what I remembered. There's no, there's no imagined conversation or composites or anything like that. But I felt that I had that safety guide there, that, you know, that, uh, that uh, I knew that people would know what I was talking about and would know how accurate or inaccurate I was. So I would just, I would just want to be very, very careful. And it was gratifying that, whatever things were said about the book, and that they weren't all uh, flattering, uh, no one said that that didn't happen like that, or that, you know, that's, that's not true. I mean, the, the, the only thing which, which really amused me was that I, I had talked about how she used to wear this Loden coat, and it was a memory of mine, how she would leave the apartment, go down, and, and go right to the street and put up her arm to hail a cab. <laughs> I, this is, I remember that so well, going out. We'd go out, and she'd go right to the curb. And that she had a hole in the, in the, <laughs> in the under the sleeve, and Peter Cameron uh, let me know that in fact many Loden coats are made with a vent in them, <laughs> and, it, and that was probably the hole. <laughs> so I thought, well, I, in, in a reprint, I'm not even going to change it. I just think it's just, <laughs> but it's just the things that you remember. That was so vivid to me. The hole in the coat when she would when she would uh, uh, hail a cab. So, anyway, moving on. That's great. That's okay. great writing. The hole in the loading code. <laughs> so, um, Wayne suggested that uh, since it's been more than a decade since uh, since I wrote about Sontag, I start off by talking a little, little bit about which of the many Susan Sontags uh, means the most to me right now? Uh, and I think I have to say, although I know that my answer would horrify her, that the one I've been thinking about the most in recent years uh, is not Sontag the writer, uh, but Sontag the human being. 
uh, insofar as she was a human being. Uh, in fact, uh, I was recently having dinner with somebody who, um, who'd known her. Uh, I never met her. Uh, and he told me about a conference he'd been to uh, where a lot of people had known her, and they started exchanging Sontag stories. Uh, and each one was a horror story about some monstrous thing that she had said or done. Uh, but the interesting thing, he said, was that these were all people who actually had a lot of affection for her. And it, it was just that all the best stories were the terrible ones. <laughs> um, similarly, uh, a few years ago, I attended a conference at CUNY, uh, which in fact both Nancy and Mo uh, participated in. Uh, and I could only get into the final event of the day, which was held in the large auditorium up there, because everything else was too packed. Um, and at that event, I listened to speaker after speaker slag Sontag's work and talk about how much they disliked her and how wrong she was about so much. Mm -hmm. uh, it was kind of amazing. And uh, I wanted to ask, uh, if she's so awful, then why are all these people here and why couldn't I get into any of the events? <laughs> Um, and, um, of course, part, that's actually part of what makes Sontag so fascinating. She's so problematic, uh, mm -hmm. both as a writer and as a person. Uh, there's a real danger, if you spend time working on her, that after a while you'll get really mad at her. <laughs> uh, I didn't feel that way when I was writing about her, but I did start to be overwhelmed by that feeling um, in the years that followed. Uh, and I really owe a debt to the other people on this panel for helping me think about her in a different way. I know this sounds like horrible brown nosing, but it's actually sincere. Um, Mo's play and Nancy's film both kind of slapped me in the head and reminded me about uh, reminded me of why I've been so excited about her in the in the first place. Uh, and Sigrid's memoir doesn't shy away from the word monster, uh, which I think is used several times. Uh, but it's written with so much affection that uh, she finally defangs that word. Mm. Uh, and I'd especially like to thank Wayne, uh, not just for uh, the beautiful essay he wrote on Sontag's influence on his work, uh, but especially for this uh, great uh, observation he makes in Nancy's film uh, about Sontag's uh, grandiosity <laughs> and about how camp it is. Uh, and about how much a part of the package of Susan Sontag it is, and finally, how funny and disarming and charming it is, or was. Uh, that comment really gave me a way not only to accept that irritating self-importance of hers, but uh, also to find a way to get a kick out of it. Uh, I didn't have that lunch with her. Uh, and in the interviews, that grandiosity is really kind of endearing, and in the writing, it's really majestic. Um, the journals that have been coming out, I'm not so sure. Uh, the other reason I've tended to think so much more lately about her as a person than as a writer is what's been and what's being published right now. Um, there are the memoirs, the lovely one that Sigrid wrote, and the troubling one by her son, David Reef, and the really nasty one by Edmund White. Uh, and then, of course, those journals. Um, and I know we're all looking forward to Benjamin Moser's uh, biography of her, which uh, I think is going to be the biography that she merits, since she uh, is that unheard of contradiction, a writer who had an interesting life. Um, I know she'd take uh, issue with my talking about her as a person rather than as a writer. Uh, and of course, those aren't really two different things. Um, no other writer is so great at conveying uh, both the sensuality of thinking uh, and its torment. Uh, one of the things she used to sneer at in interviews was the notion of writing as self-expression. She said it a bunch of times. She really hated that cliché. Uh, but uh, the journals make clear, as though it hadn't been clear already, uh, what a troubled sense of self she really had. And although every one of those incredibly crystalline and sibylline sentences in her essays seem styled to be impersonal. Um, as, as you get to know them and as you get to know her, it becomes clear just how much each one of them is saying, I exist and this is who I am, just as desperately as every one of Van Gogh's uh, brushstrokes. 
And uh, that desperation I find really moving and recognizable and human. And it's uh, what's allowed me to like and even uh, love her again sometimes. <laughs> uh, and, and to want to return to her real accomplishment, which is those essays. I, I just want to say one thing, one thing in, in appreciation, but also in response to Craig, which is, so I'm sure you have all gone through this, but you know, I went through this thing where first I put her on a pedestal, I mean, there's a little joke in the title of the film regarding Susan Sontag because I did hold her in high regard at the beginning. And apparently there's no gerund form of that, of to regard, you know, there's regarding like looking at and there's regarding like we put in our email. But I briefly dated this English professor and she's like, there's no gerund of to regard. <laughs> um, and then I went through this period where I couldn't stand her. And um, I had to send the film to her sister Judith before we finished it. I wasn't giving her editorial control, I just wanted her to see what we were doing. So I didn't have the final music in it, but it was pretty much otherwise done. And I wrote her this note and I said, you know, I think I've come to this place of compassion for her and particularly for you. And I, I said, I sort of feel like I'm her little sister too and what an impossible thing to have a big sister who is as brilliant and beautiful and impossible and, you know, a pain in the neck as your sister. And Judith read the letter and she called me up and she was crying. She hadn't even watched the film. She just, just she was crying about the letter. But I, I do think that, that you can, no matter how much time you work on this woman, you can come to a new place with her. And, you know, so I sort of feel all those things that you said, but I, I think, my, you know, I, I guess I, a lot of the people I talked to had what I called post-Sontag stress disorder. Um, and it was sort of like uh, coming to me to come to talk to them was like it was therapy for them. Um, but I think that, you know, you can come to love her in spite of how difficult she was. And it's kind of a sweet thing about a lot of the people, even the people who have PSSD. <laughs> Did you want to say something, Mom? Not yet. <laughs> I'm struck listening to all of you by many things, but uh, first of all, the um, the sense of how person uh, you, Sigrid, you're you're the, you're royalty here because you knew her, and have uh, raw material of a riveting nature, and you've been sitting your feet forever just to hear these stories. But the rest of us. Um, have a Sontag problem to the extent that we've internalized a figure that we, who, whom we never knew. And there's something, I think, for the difficulty notwithstanding, but on the page, the paradox of impersonality and a figure, an embodied and riveting figure that we want to take personally and that we develop a complicated inner life about. And it can't just be we besotted Sontag fans that have that. So I, that's, and it's not just her good looks, which is, I think, the, the easy thing that gets said, oh, you know, this was the jacket photo, so, you know, or that she knew Andy Warhol. It's, it's, not, it's something about the sentences that have the embodied. Well, yeah, and also, well, it certainly wasn't just about the looks or the image, because one of the things that I mentioned was the number of people, and Craig, I believe you're one of them, who said, uh, she, without knowing her, only talking about reading her as a young person, she was the one who made me want to be a writer. Didn't you say that too? And, the, and, and there are quite a few people, and, the, and these are people who, this includes people who were, uh, the fiction, who ended up writing fiction or nonfiction, whatever. So there was something about that, and I think part of it was that she had and she suffered from this because people, people, uh, you know, made fun of her for this. She really, she, she really took herself very seriously, and she took what she did very seriously, and what she, what she uh, uh, passed on to people who who paid attention to her uh, was that to want to spend your life reading and writing was not just a a positive thing, it was a noble thing, it could even be a heroic thing. And
and it certainly wasn't a, 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 a waste of time or something that you could be doing something better. I mean, just so she had that idea of the writer. Of, I mean, it, in this way, she reminds me of Virginia Woolf. This sense of of uh, a, a, of writing as a religious thing, as a religion. So I think that is definitely something that that, that people respond to. Um, it's not that there isn't anyone else who's Who's, who's like that, but, the, but she, she really embodied it. I mean, you felt in that way that, uh, that she, was, she was an ideal model for that and that, she, and that she also braved a certain amount of scorn because she was well aware that people, that people thought she took everything and herself too seriously and sometimes would even publicly mock her for that. Um, and this went along with one of the reasons why I wanted to, uh, something that I really very much wanted to put in my book was this argument against what, what everyone carries on about uh, her having, uh, you know, being absolutely without any humor. And I certainly know where it came from, but it wasn't, it wasn't really accurate. It's just that, you know, it was, that it was this thing of, of being so afraid of not being taken seriously, which was, which was partly about being a woman. Mm -hmm. Um, that you know that that made her create a, a, almost a kind of stony way of being, and that and that sometimes you know to be honest could could make her seem kind of ridiculous, you know. And um, that, but that's what I think it had a lot to do with the the, the effect that she had. Great. Uh, for better or worse, that humor um, I think is something that the people who knew her really got to witness and enjoy but it's almost completely lacking on the page. There are a couple yeah. of essays where there's some things, uh, of, I'm thinking uh, particularly the uh, imagination of disaster, where she says some things that are really funny, but, um, but you, um, again, for better or worse, I mean, um, that's, that's who she was as a writer. I don't think uh, also that we can underestimate the importance of her image, uh, even though she sometimes uh, made light of it. Um, I don't think there's any writer that I read anyway um, that I read with, how can I put this, her image is always in my head mm -hmm. as I'm reading her, uh, really more so than with any other writer than, uh, that I can think of, uh, except maybe Henry James. Uh, and she's, um, she was well aware of it. She, um, uh, she used it, I think, in a really brilliant and admirable way. Stephen Koch in uh, Nancy's film talks about the incredible star quality she had, uh, something that um, you can't learn, that you can only have. And she had it and she used mm -hmm. it, and although I think she still would have been famous if she had um, been uh, quite hideous looking, uh, she wasn't. Uh, she had that great image and it became a part of the package along with grandiosity. Well. You don't have to. Yeah. I just was thinking when, because you, you you don't exactly look. You have you have a beauty and grandeur of your own, but you don't actually you don't look like Sontag. But you start to in the play. Mm -hmm. You there's a without imitating her body language or her voice, you you remind us of uh, that Sontag's mind dwells within a body. I don't know if you have anything to say about how you channeled her physicality. Um, gosh, I don't, uh, I, did, I didn't, Mike? oh sure, I didn't um, study her physicality or like, uh, I mean there's, there's some interviews on, uh, you know, in, on uh, video from film or television, very, very um, hilarious interview with her and Agnes Varda at the uh, New York Film yeah. Festival, that's yeah. wonderful, you should all go home and YouTube that, because um, it's really great. Um, you know, she's so, she, they're both smoking furiously on television, you know, so it was a, a period in time um, that we are not in right now. But, um, you know, it, uh, uh, it was, uh, I can only say that it was a total pleasure to speak those words every night that, uh, you know, whenever I perform the show, it's a lot of words. She was a wordy lady, right? And it is a lot of words, a lot of dense language that's not theatrical language. But it was such a pleasure to speak those words. And I think it's the physical action of having to make those sounds in that order that informed me. Because I, I don't, you know, she was a tall, striking beauty, you know. 
and like I'm not. And so I, I can't be that, you know, uh, but her mind and um, how it worked is, is still fascinates me, endlessly fascinating. And to try and in some small way make a theatrical representation of that uh, was, was a great challenge and, and a great honor and pleasure. And uh, so I don't know if that's exactly answering your question, but... Yeah, it's great. There's one moment in the play where you lie back on the desk, and it's mm. there's a famous photo. I don't know which photo it is of Sontag, where she's sure. yeah, 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 yeah. just like that. And mm. that. That seems to be what you're doing, but it's at a very mm. um, pivotal moment. Yeah, she's having a bad day. <laughs> <laughs> but culture's having a good day. Yes, yes. Because of her repose. Yeah, yeah. She and and yeah. I think too a lot about uh, how. Um, Un, I mean, again, we're living in a very different time now, but, you know, she was constantly getting into these um, fracases and dust-ups with people over politics or, you know, something outrageous, some, you know, very unpopular position she would take. And, you know, she would just say things, you know, and now everyone is so managed, you know, for the media. And it, it, it's kind of astonishing to see her very, very un, I mean, and it, it, it's the time as well, but this very unvarnished opinion, right? And boy, she had some opinions, right? So it's so refreshing. <laughs> I mean, we just do not see that now in, in our heavily mediated world. We, we don't, people do not allow themselves, especially if they're a public figure, to, you know, have outbursts. <laughs> But it's, it's so fun to watch, you know, it really is. So. Roseanne Barr. Yeah, no, I wanted to say that I always found it interesting that she, um, she just didn't seem vain about her looks to me at all. I mean, she, she, once she said, um, you know, sometimes I look, first of all, she complained about things that she felt weren't unattractive, bags under her eyes, thick ankles, weight problem. And she, but she said, um, you know, sometimes I look in the mirror and I think, oh, I'm, I'm pretty good looking. And other times, you know, her heart just sank, you know, just like, just like anybody else. Like, God, I'm not very attractive, am I? And, um, but another time she said, um, the difference between you and me is she said that you'll, you know, put on makeup and be very careful about what you're going to put on and all that. Um, and with me, I feel like, um, like in other words, you you try to make yourself look attractive. That's the that's the feminine way. But my way is, I, I don't do that. I feel like, if you'll look at me, you know, if you will, you will might find that I am attractive. But I'm not going to do anything to help you. So, and that is a different attitude. And that's why I just don't. I mean, maybe she had moments of extreme. I mean, you know, people are always telling you you're striking and beautiful. I mean, it must go to your head to some extent. But I didn't see that. Mm -hmm. I really no. didn't see much of that at all. Don't tell me she didn't have some serious conversations with her hairdresser. <laughs> well, the hairdresser. Well, it was the hairdresser's idea. <laughs> it was the hairdresser's idea that she leave the streak in there so that it would look more natural when she did she did dye her hair she did wear men's cologne <laughs> she, dear, um. Um, but, but, but she but she didn't uh, you know like she would she would she'd be going somewhere she didn't try to dress so that even though even she, she knew a lot of people were going to be looking at her she would just she would dress very poorly what would be considered very poorly so she didn't really spend time on her Looks and she also was never, never. I never, ever, ever saw any jealousy in her, any envy in her about another woman's looks. Never, never. So I could give a graduate disquisition on this whole subject. I think um, partly because, you know, we dealt with over. I think it's like 130 archives from around the world and the photographers. <laughs> and you know, we've had discussions about makeup or hair stylists that worked with the photographers and. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So, and also, if you study the photographs very carefully, she goes through these very butch periods and very femi periods, you know. And there's um, what's her name? Sophie Cassouls, I think. Um, there's a there's this French photographer who just, who photographed her a lot in the mid '70s, and she's like, mm -hmm. it's very femi. She's you know, I don't know what she's wearing. There's some where she's got her hands behind her head, and then she goes to this intense butch period in the early '80s, which I love, of course. Um, but it was our job to think about her image intensely in the film. Um, 
One of, an academic who saw an early cut of it said, you're fetishizing her face. What are you doing that for? And I said, the film is partly about her image as a famous writer and you know a writer who used her looks. And of course, it's very complicated because Sontag wanted to be looked at um, by men. And, you know, she wanted to be in a man's world as a writer, which was not, did not have a lot of women, particularly intellectuals, at that level. She wanted to be perceived as sexy in a heterosexual sense or heteronormative mm -hmm. sense. She was mostly dating women. So this is very complicated stuff that, you know, who's looking at her? What are they looking at? What is she looking at? And these are part of the things, not everything, but it was partly why I thought it was possible to make a film about a writer, because if you think about writing, it's not an action sport. You know, film is good at somebody running down the street or someone throwing a javelin. Like, you know, what do writers do? They sit in front of a piece of paper or a typewriter or a computer and they write. It's not, you can't film it, right? Um, and so people were like, what, you know, why would you even do this? And, and of course, we can't go into the depth about the writing that Craig could or that Wayne could or the rest of you could. Um, but, but what we could do was help you think about that image. And so, I don't know if we fetishize it, we, you know, it reverberates in every minute of the film, and that was a very intentional choice. And I, I think it's an important thing, you know, we could not go, I mean, people, I was afraid that we wouldn't be able to deal with the work at all because it's not the right medium. And I was afraid people would think I was stupid, particularly in New York City, um, because, you know, I've read it all. You know, I even read all those damn novels that she wrote, which I, you know, <laughs> it was painful. <laughs> Um, but um, and of course I've been to the archives I don't know four times et cetera et cetera um, but but the fact is that in a visual medium what we the great advantage that we have for those images so you know we threw them against each other we did everything we could do to make sure that you had both a sense of the living person on you know when she was being interviewed but also this image. I'm going to make a didactic point to see if you all agree because I feel it so strongly listening to you. Um, we're talking about the image, which is all I ever want to talk about. But the fact is, I think that her work can be read from the very first sentence of The Benefactor as a dramatic monologue. The essays, and to that extent, to, to separate the essays with their obvious success, and the fiction with some of its obvious lacks, um, or to even separate her image versus her Apollonian work, her popular image, her Apollonian work, um, doesn't take in the whole package, which is, again, from the benefactor, a certain, a voice of a certain tormented esthete who um, is always um, in, um, shaping sentences as acts of survival, one by one. And that the, the drama of the whole work becomes like, I think, all her heroes, Simone Weil, Walter Benjamin, um, the task of, no more tasks, the, the, the the task of how on earth do you make a viable life for yourself? And her choice was from the beginning, create a self and do it in sentences. And the fact that she was also good looking, also had, you know, good ethics.